So allow me to add to the stage Rainer Krim, who is our speaker tonight. So many of you know Rainer. He has been here a couple of times already, and he told me that this time it's the fourth time. And still, I, I read his bio uh, to just introduce him to the people that have not seen him before. So Rainer has worked as a software architect, team lead, and instructor for about 20 years. In his spare time, he likes to write articles about C++, Python, and Haskell, but he also likes to speak at conferences. He publishes very often on his blog, Modern C++, and now he's a trainer giving seminars to Modern C++, but also Python. His books, and they have various books, um, are published both at O'Reilly, but also at Lean Tabab. Now, um, at the end of last year, and has made it public that he is suffering from ALS. Now, in case you're not familiar with ALS, ALS is a pretty wicked nerve disease. And unfortunately, very unfortunately, at this point in time, not curable. Now, of course, you can imagine that for him personally, but also for this entire, for his entire family, this is a pretty terrible shock, a pretty terrible setback. But despite this setback, Rainer is still giving online trainings. He's still contributing to the community by giving public talks just as today, but also by writing in his blog. And now, truly, from my point of view, this is truly astounding. So now, instead of leaning back and just taking care of himself, he is still helping the community, helping everybody in our community to become better programmers. And this is truly marvelous. So uh, at this point, Rainer, from my bottom of the heart, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I strongly believe that everyone in this virtual room pretty much also every single member of the C++ community would at this point stand up and applaud for at least a minute. Okay, and I know that this is, in, in this virtual setting, this is not really what uh, what will happen, but please imagine that this is, um, yeah, uh, uh, a real gratitude from the entire community. All right, but now, without further ado, I give you the stage to lead us into a deep dive about the concurrency improvements in C++. Thanks a lot, Klaus, for your warm words. Uh, when I speak, you sometimes hear a little bit of interrupt. This is due to the fact that I get, air, get that I get air, and this interferes sometimes with my voice. But anyway, I can speak very well. So I'm totally happy to give a talk today. And I talk about concurrency improvement in C20. And I dive a little bit deeper. Dive a little bit deeper. So what I will talk about is exactly this part here. I ignore the big four, the core language improvements, the library improvements, and only talk about concurrency. And sometimes I also give a little bit an out view or give an overview of the past. Therefore, you can uh, appreciate the new feature in a better way. Sometimes I give you a little break to ask me questions. We will see. Let's start with atomics. First of all, this is C++ 11 related. Atomics are the foundation of the C++ memory model. Because they establish, they are atomic, of course, and they establish synchronization ordering constraints. And the key part about the synchronization and ordering constraints is that they also hold for non-atomics. Therefore, all concurrency is based on atomics, which, uh, which establish rules for non-atomics. And under the hood, when you do something like create a thread, join a thread, lock a mutex, unlock a mutex, let the condition variable wait and notify, this boils down to operations on atomics, which now technical term apply a, a, a acquiring semantics. So you see, atomics are the the pillars of all. And this is what atomics could do in C11. We have an atomic flag. 
with a very, very simple interface. You can say gear or you can say test and set. It has essentially two states. With gear, you put it, let's say, in the false state. With test and, test and set, you put it in the true state. But here's the extremely interesting observation. When you say test and set, it returns you the old value. Maybe true, maybe false. Atomic flag has an outstanding feature. And this outstanding feature is it's the only data type graph in C++ which is guaranteed to be log free. What's more, the only data type. All the others are to the atomic and specializations of this class templates. For pointers, integral types, user defined types and with 20 floating points and smart pointers. And there can use other hood a locking mechanism. What's more, they can have a locking mechanism, but not atomic flick. In particular, smart pointers nowadays use always a lock under the hood. So this is what's 11. This is the 11 interface before I talk about the new 20 interface. What's more with atomic flag, you can test, say, test and set it here. With stood atomic, you can ask if this one uses a lock. You can load it, you can store it, you can exchange it. You can add something to it or increment and decorate. Fetch add and plus equal behaves differently. Fetch add returns the old value. This guy returns the new value. I got this slide. Compare exchange strong and compare exchange weak. Ah, uh, the bread and butter of atomic operations. They are to be, they are to be called pass operation. Compare and swap. Because this is what's happening. Look at this slide. You want to exchange atomic with a uh, with desired. So what's happening? In one atomic operations, you compare atomic with expected. When both values are equal, you replace atom with desired. And to return to. When both values are not equal, so atom is not equal to the expectation. You replace your expectation with the current value of atom and return false. And this works because typically you do this in a loop. I know this is a little bit complicated, but also very important. Therefore, let me show you an example. And I implement fetch mult, atomic multiplication, based on compare exchange. Strong. This was wrong. Let me was for this happening here. This should open my browser. Now I have it. Here you see this is an atomic multiplication. So what I, what I do is the following. I have an atomic int. And multiply it by 5. 
of course, this gives me back 25. This is easy. But now see how how uh, how this looks like. By the way, I used here C plus plus 20 feature, the concept integral. But this is not the key point of, about this algorithm. So let's have a look here. Fetch mult takes atomic key by reference and here is the number I want to multiply it with. Then this is what to be happens. First you load the old value of shares, you see. Then you make an endless loop here while. Let me say you make a loop. In this loop, you compare shared to the old value of shared. When they are equal, you replace shared with old value times byte. You just multiply. And you return to here yeah, for it beats the multiplication was successful. If something happened in between line seven and line eight, you adapt the value of old value to shared. You return false or do it once more. So this is atomic qualification which would be successful when they do it by millions of threads concurrently. This is fetch by that. Oh, sorry. I should say fetch by Let's jump back. There's more to atomics. Atomics have an extended interface. This holds for atomic flag. It's not atomic. Now we are 20. Now what you can do with atomic is you can use them for notifications. Notify one, notify all, and wait. This wait works special. This wait blocks if atom is equal to val. If not, it will not block. What's more, when atom is equal to val, this call blocks. And next to that, you can pretty easy make a conditional workflow. I don't know if the conditional workflow is right. I have two threads. Let's say I produce a consumer workflow. You have two threads. One is waiting for work. One is preparing the data. And I have one atomic pool here, which I initialize to false. This means by waiting guy waits. Because atomic pool is equal to false. It waits until the set data ready set ready set data ready thread stores to its side and afterwards notifies. Now this guy, this waiting guy, can continue. In a few seconds I will show you. The same workflow using conditional and you will see how, how complicated that is. Let's go further. Uh, let me say a few words about shared pointer. Oh yeah, let me quote my, my favorite uh, quote from uh, 
totally forgot. The most important part of the most important rule of Kokozi. Forget what you learned in kindergarten. Don't share. But a shared pointer shares by design. Therefore, it's pretty complicated. What's the mighty semantic semantic of a smart pointer? A shared pointer. It's kind of thread safe. The control block is thread safe, but not resource. So uh, half thread safe. Therefore, at 20, we have a new specialization of Studatomic. Studatomic shared pointer. Studatomic weak pointer. These are the three points for atomic smart pointers. Stated by Herbsatter. We need them out of consistency. Why? You may not know it, but shared pointer in 11 had an external property. It was the only non-atomic on which you could apply atomic operations. This was not consistent. Second, correctness. It's pretty easy. That you do instead of that. that you. But this is probably an issue. But this not. So far, you can easily forget to use atomic operations when you deal with sun shepherd. In the next reason why we need an explicit type is the following. When we would make the shared pointer, including its resource, thread safe, we would optimize for the raw use case. Meaning in general should the shared pointer don't use a locking mechanism. Only if you, if you want to do it. Okay, therefore, we have a new, a new data type. There's a similar data type, at least when you read its name. Atomic ref, which is pretty clever. This meets with atomic ref. Also, the referenced object is atomic. On operation, the uh, referenced uh, object is atomic. Of course, when you have a reference, the referenced object must exceed the lifetime of the atomic graph. It's pretty easy to remember the interface. Atomic graph behaves extremely similar to the atomic. You can use the same data types and it has the same interface, such as to the atomic. Let me show you an example. This was wrong. This was wrong, now I have it. Go on, now it's happening. Here I use, where is it? Here, atomic graph. Here we are, atomic graph. And now let me explain you this uh, program. First of all, I have an expensive to copy thing. Then I invoke the multi function count, taking exp by reference. Now I have a thread of vector of threads and I encapsulate my counter. You see? Expensive to copy as counter. And I encapsulate it here in atomic graph in the counter. Now I start 10 threads. Each thread 
performs the same lambda. It takes count by reference, gets a random number between 1 and 200, and increments counter so often. At the end, we have the value 1519, which means we uh, make sense. This is not a database. Why not? Because X counter is encapsulated in an atomic, uh, in an atomic graph. Now let's see what's happening. When I make out of atomic graph, just an int. Let me make a short detour. When you do concurrency, I strongly suggest that you use any tool to help you check your code. Check if your code is right. Good. Here you sanitize. And now let's have a look. See now, the counter is just a, a what should I say, an unprotected value, just not atomic graph such as before. Oh, this is a bad error message. Let me switch to the older GCC. You should see what I did. I use F sanitize equals red, but it's cheap. But I will use a different and older one. Ah, let me use an older GCC. Then today I, I get a really red, bad error message. I only got unexpected memory mapping. Usually I get a, got a better one. Let me try it once more. This time I use Clang. But you see at least, here's an error message. But the error, uh, the error message is not really readable. Clang, clang, clang. Let's try this one out. Oh, today I'm out of luck. Usually you get a better error message, which indicates which line is wrong. I have no idea what the compiler is doing today. Compile explorer. But what's more, the issue is that counter is not a topic. So, this was it about atomics, you see. Really, now I have time to answer questions. Andreas, do you have any right. questions? So, um, at this point, there's no question in, sorry, the, in the chat. Sorry, Klaus. Klaus, sorry. I said Andreas. No, no, no problem. <laughs> so at, at this point, there is no question in the chat. However, I, I think you're truly just out of luck. Yeah, usually this works better. Um, might be in a, a general uh, problem with the the installations at uh, this is the exactly. Explorer. I don't know, but um, I, I think everybody got the the point that you tried to make. Yeah, um, atomic graph. Yeah, use atomic graph instead, and suddenly there is no question anymore. Yesterday it worked, by the way, because right. yesterday I tried it out. There is one question now. Um, 
other slides shared. So this is something that I can answer. So the, the talk is recorded. You will be able to watch this later at, um, so watch it again uh, on, uh, you, uh, or on Twitch. And we will have the talk in our YouTube channel also. Uh, Rainer, do you plan to submit the slides too? Oh, I don't of course, know. I can send them to you. Okay. Afterwards, I send them to you. Then you have all the exams integrated. Meaning that now you can try it out what's more. Okay, perfect. Then another question. Um, um, why not use the atomic int instead of atomic ref int? What's the question about it? So um, could you also reuse just an atomic int instead of referencing the int inside the uh, the, the expensive to copy object? Uh, of course. Okay. You can do it. The issue yeah. is uh, the idea of atomic ref is you may only make it for a short period of time, atomic, something like that. Mm -hmm. But atomic int is always atomic. Okay, perfect. Then please go on. Yeah, um, and we'll, okay. we'll take another break for questions. Now let me continue with semaphores. Semaphores are a synchronization mechanism to control access to a shared variable. This means you initialize a semaphore with a counter greater than zero, requesting the semaphore or acquiring it, decrements the counter, releasing the semaphore, increments the counter. When the counter is zero, the requesting thread is blocked. Our semaphore is called a uh, counting semaphore. And there is a full specialization what you see this is a glass template this is the full interface this is the maximum value of the counter with release you release the semaphore and by default it's uh, the counter Do I acquire? The counter is uh, decremented by one. By acquire, it's incremented by one. There's a array. With try acquire, you try and out. Now I have it. Sorry, sorry, I was a little bit irritated. With release, the count is incremented by default by one. This means another semaphore who wants to get a semaphore by saying acquire will get a semaphore. Acquire decrements the counter by one. This called blocks the counter is zero. Try acquire tries to do it once, but it will, will not block. So the, uh, it decrements the count by one or tries to decrement it. Try acquire four, try acquire two, do the same, but only for limited time. This one can block forever. Because when the count is zero, this will block forever. To be specific, acquire will block forever, not try acquire. Sorry for the irritation, but don't have it. Let me show you the same workflow such as before. Waiting for work, set, data ready, not the same similar workflow. First, I have a counting semaphore, 
which can at most have the value 1, but is initialized with 0. Meaning, when waiting for more, 1, when waiting for work, that's right, perform waiting for work. What's to acquire the server for? It will be blocked because its value is zero. But when the other guy releases it, the value goes from zero to what, and therefore this guy can have it. So this is a way to synchronize two threads. And I will show it to you in a few seconds. A pretty fast way. This was the wrong direction. And now I, sorry, I have to talk about it. I say a few words about condition variables. Because this is the classical way to implement uh, send receiver, produce a consumer workflow. We have a condition variable. What can say one, a condition variable, can say one and all. To define one, notify all. On the other end, the send condition variable can be used to wait. Without a time limit and with time limits. Therefore, a pretty, pretty, pretty easy concept. But condition rebels are really complicated at root because they can be victims to two phenomena. Spurs wake up and lost wake up. What does Spurs wake up and lost wake up mean? Spurs wake up means imagine you are in the bed, you wait for the alarm clock to go, and now for some reason you are awake. But it was not the alarm clock, it was some background noise. Maybe the cat was scratching at the door. This is Spurious Wake Up. This means when you use a condition level, you should in general use unpredicate, which checks in this case, was it the alarm clock or the cat? When you are on bed, the predicate could be your alarm clock. You, show, you look at the clock and you recognize it's too late or not too late. Okay, this is where these three points here. This is a spurious wake up. What we also have, which I will show you in a few seconds, what we also have is a lost wake up. Lost wake up means you go to bed, for example, after the alarm clock went. This is a lost wake up, or you will experience it as a deadlock. Because you wait for the bed, which will never happen again. Okay. And condition variables are victims to those issues. Let me explain the workflow, which is very complicated, based on this. Based on the waiter. This is the waiter. It uses a unique clock puts a mutex inside and waits 
Crystal locked unique lock. Add crystal is predicate, which is in my case a lambda. And here this predicate returns. If ready is true or false. Because immediately before I send the notification to the double thread, I put ready to true. This ready is kind of my alarm clock on which I check the time. Now let's see what's happening. I go to wait call. Hi. Give me the lock the mutex. And then I check if return ready is set. When the return ready returns true, I know that this already happens. I know that notify one. Uh, so the alarm clock already went. As you, this returns false. Because maybe it was the cat. This means I release immediately the unique lock and the mutex and put myself to sleep. Then at some point in the future, I will get a notification. And this means, when I get a notification, um, when I get a notification, I First check if return ready is set. If the return ready is set, it's already time to stand up. When return ready is not set, it was the cat. Now return ready is set, which means this call uh, triggered to notification. And now I continue here while holding uh, the unique lock it's locked until I uh, I'm done with the scope here. So what's more? In general use, you have to use an additional predicate. If not, you are pretty easy. You can be pretty fast victim of a lost makeup. Why? Because the standard sets a weight will only recognize a notify if it's in the weight state. And we cannot show which state this thread is because this is threading. So this is the good case. Let me show an example. It's exactly the, pro the program from before. This guy waits on data ready. And this guy here puts data ready to do. Exactly as I described it. And now let me show you something. Uh, here, here I probably I'm not sure if this works. The point is that data ready happens before data is ready, before waiting for work. Have a look. When this call Habs. Before this call, that this would be a deadlock. This beats the alarm clock goes before you are in bed. Let me show it to you. Now I modify this program a little bit. Uh, I have something prepared. This is wrong.
كان فايف عايب لك سلو The same program such as before, but this time I will remove the predicate. Have a look. I replaced line 16 with line 17. Okay, now it's pretty easy to get a uh, lost mega, which means a deadlock. So let me execute this program. This was nonsense. Then condition. Then there's a, I have it, a few seconds, please. There are so many cont, I have it. Let's, let execute this. You see, when waiting for work, appears before that is ready all is fine but when that is ready appears before ready for work we'll have a deadlock let's try it out a few times is there no history here No luck so far. Usually it's a 50 50 chance. We have a little bit of interleaving. Come on, send the P faster. Damn. The starter out of luck. Two types. Each time the worker comes first. Now, now I have a deadlock, you see? Data is ready before waiting for work. This means waiting for work it's forever, meaning deadlock. And the reason was what's more. I removed the predicate here. Okay. And now I come to the key question. There are now many, many ways to synchronize threads in 20. With 11, you can essentially only use this rebel. But in 20, we have more, way more. Okay, uh, let me kill this program. Um, so let's see here. And now I want to make a short game. I call it ping pong game. One thread executes a ping function, the other thread a pong function. The pink thread waits. For the notification of the pong thread, it sets the notification back to pong thread. The game should stop after one million ball exchanges. And now the question is, how fast can we play ping pong? I'm sorry to say it, but with a condition variable. We don't see the result because it's too slow. Let me explain you in a few seconds. A few. You see, this was a denied 
في الصويصة تركي وانا بديوست دا عبدية لابي سيت هو بانسا وستي Now it should work. But only 1,000 you see, not 1 million. So this is the program. I have a pink sweat and a pong sweat. And here I measure the execution time. The, the pink sweat checks if count is smaller than count limit because I want only want to exchange the ball 1,000 times. Then it waits until data when it becomes false. Puts it to two and sets the notification back, but using this, not the, uh, the second condition variable. It waits on the first, notifies the second. And the pong thread does exactly the same, but how should I say it? The opposite. Instead of false, it waits for two. It uses condition variable two to wait and one to notify, you see. Okay. Then let me show you the next play. This time I use atomic flag. Okay. And this guy is really, really fast. Meaning it should work here. Okay. I hope at least. Takes a little bit longer. Yeah. You see nine seconds. And this is what they do. Atomic flag is initialized to false. And atomic flag blocks when atomic flag is equal to false. So when this value here is the same, such as the value atomic flag. Then it blocks. Then I start. I set it to two. Here I set it to two. This means this guy here blocks. But this guy can continue because he has the value two. Then I put it to false. And notify the other. This is how I can synchronize this atomic flag. Pretty similar. I can use an atomic pool. You see, I put it to false. By the way, don't believe the numbers. This was really strange. Usually, atomic flag is faster. Okay, I put it to two. To false. And now you see, I wait on false. Put it to false and notify. And here I do the same. The other way around. By the way, here I grab my counter. Must be atomic. Okay, and now to the last solution. I use a semaphore. Ping pong. First, I release. Uh, let me let me start here. I use two semaphores. Both are initialized to zero, but can. And both have the value one. Okay, this is what I do. 
I release signal to ping. Now signal to ping has the value one. This means this guy can continue, but this guy is blocked. It's auto receive. Signal to pick acquire. Signal to pong release any other way around. So usually I have two questions now. What is the nicest way to synchronize? With nice, I mean what is the easiest way? What is uh what is uh the easiest way to implement? But I will the answer, answer for you. I in general would do all, but would never use condition variable. And second, this is a little bit difficult to answer today. What's the fastest way to synchronize? Here are the numbers on physical PCs. By PCs. And you see, condition variables are always the slowest. And what astonished me the, the most was that semaphores are the same ballparks, ballpark as atomic flag or atomic pool. This astonished me really. Okay. Now it's time for question. Klaus. All right. So we do not have a question right now, but give them a, a couple of seconds. It always takes a little bit um, of time to, to type. Um, I have a question I, in the meantime. Uh, so if not, I have also a remark. <laughs> I forget to mention something. Perfect. When I talk about a semaphore, it's for me like a generalized mutex. But there's one, one big difference. A mutex must always be released and required from the same thread, but not a semaphore. This is the big difference for me. Mm -hmm. So this All was right. my remark, I forgot Perfect. to say it. There is a question now. Um, let me read it and show it at the same time. So, is that intentional that in ping pong game based on conditional variable, there is no check for the deadlock mentioned earlier? There is a check implicitly mm -hmm. because I use two predicates. One here, the lambda here, and also here. This is by, uh, this is how I can guarantee that no oh, spurs or lost makeup will appear. All right. So I, I think this may answer the question. Yeah. Um, then I have a question. Then have four different approaches. I could pretty much use all of them, whereas condition variables seem to be perhaps a little slow. But which one do you feel is the most simple to use, the most intuitive one? I said it, but usually I would ask you, told okay. you, uh, Klaus, you in, in total. I prefer all of them. I, okay. I could live with atomic flag, put atomic or mm -hmm. semaphores. But the only, what I, I always say, never use it if, if you don't have to, is condition variable. But to be honest, I'm a big fan of a semaphore. Mm -hmm. This acquire release is so nice to read. That is pretty much why I asked for, to me personally, this feels the most intuitive. Yeah, the most- It's um, the same for me. Yeah, okay. So we agree. So Stefan has a question. Um, do you have an explanation of where the time of condition variable is last? Do threads get de-rescheduled? How fast would busy waiting versus dot wait be in your ping pong benchmarks? I think there's two questions in one, but okay. I don't know why the condition rebels. I don't know it. So this was the first part of the question. I'm really astonished that it is so slow. Mm -hmm. 
it was was the second part. Okay, the second question is how fast would busy waiting versus dot wait be in your ping pong benchmarks? You can try it out busy waiting. For all of you, busy waiting means essentially that when you wait here, you don't go into the kernel. You will wait the entire time. Let me give you a picture. Yeah, two ways to go into my room. So let's do it differently. Mm -hmm. We talk about sleeping. There are two ways to ensure that you wake up at five o'clock. First time, first way would be permanently watch your clock. This is busy waiting. Your brain will be 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, another one would be you sleep 50, uh, two minutes, wake up, look at the clock, and do it until you are finished. This is the other way. And this is essentially how a mood text works. It goes into the kernel to sleep. And then checks. In this way, it means what CPU goes to. 100%. Mm -hmm. All right, there's another question. I, I think this is a good one. Um, are there still, still valid use cases to prefer one of the worse or slower primitives? So I think, of course, uh, this is referring to condition variables. Would you think there are still use cases for conditional variables? I have a simple one. I talk in a few minutes about cooperative interruption. Okay. Perfect. Condition variable edit can support a special use case. This mm -hmm. is a 20x stage. But not condition variable. Condition variable edit is a generalized condition variable. They have an extended interface 20. And now we can wait in this. So we can interrupt the special way. Mm -hmm. But condition variable I don't have. I would say it's it's not an implementation detail. Not more. Which is a which is a good answer. Or higher abstractions. Mm -hmm. Maybe a future where you wait for promise. All right. Thank you. Then let, let's go on. Um and we'll have another break for um yeah for, for questions later. So I talk about lectures and prayers. They work similar to similar to semaphores. Essentially, a thread waits at a synchronization point until the count becomes zero. What's more, a semaphore blocks when the count is zero. A ledge blocks the count is bigger than zero. The barriers are similar. So what's the ledge? It has these four functions. Countdown. Atomically decrements the counter with update without blocking the corner. So the counter starts bigger than zero. And here it's counted down. Tire rate means returns true if the count is zero. Wait means returns immediately if the count is zero. It will not block if the count is zero. And finally, we have arrived in wait. This first calls countdown, then wait. Let me show you an example. What's more, ledges and pairs are extremely nice beats to synchronize workflows. Here I have one, two, three, six workers.
And now I have a look. I have a latch, which I initialize with six. Because I only use the synchronized out. I only use the synchronized out function to get a nice output. You can ignore this. And here I say arrive and wait. And here is what the worker are doing. Say say arrive and wait. Pleading each one. T commits the counter by one. And waits if the count is bigger than zero. This means this is the point. where all the threads are waiting until all are done because I have six workers. Therefore, each worker says work done and then they say see you tomorrow. You see, this is my synchronization point here. And this is pretty easy to use. There's one issue or let me say limitation to select you can use a ledge only once when you want to use the ledge more than once you have to switch to a barrier this is a barrier this is the interface for of barrier Arrive, tick commits the count by update. Wait, waits until the completion step is done. I would say if you want what the completion step means. Arrive and wait is equivalent to arrive and then wait. And arrive and drop. This special. This call decorates the counter for the current iteration and says for the next iteration, I'm out of the game. I will show you an example which makes this, we should make this clear. Here's the completion step. What's the completion step? When the counter becomes zero, the completion step or completion phase uh, starts. And here you can execute the arbitrary function. Meaning the barrier gets a function which is executed when one iteration is done. This means one of the thread is a walk and executes this function. Okay. Usually when you use a barrier, the barrier starts in the next iteration with the same counter. But when you see RF, say, when you see RF in the top, the counter is decremented for the next iteration. Okay, I know this was a little bit complicated, but this example should make it pretty clear. Now I have a way more complicated workflow. I have to Full-time worker and part-time worker. Full-time worker have to work at the morning and at the afternoon. Part-time worker only at the morning. You see, I have 
three full-time, three part-time workers. Can I start all of them? Let me start with the part-time worker. They get their name and then say, hey, arrive and drop. This means after the morning session is done, say go home. This means the count is decremented from six to three. Because I have three part-time workers. The full-time workers instead say arrive and wait. Here the count is six. Here the count is three. Okay, this is the counter. And now you see it here. Six guys working in the morning and only three in the afternoon. Of course, this example is constructed. But you see, barriers can be reused. This is exactly the use case for barriers. When you have the repetitive workflow. If not, you are fine with the ledge. Now I talk about cooperative interruption. And um, synchronized output streamers, then I open for question. Cooperative interruption. First of all, it's an extremely bad idea to kill a thread. By the way, you can do it in piece thread, but the documentation says, please, please don't do it. Because when you kill a thread, you have no idea in which state the thread is. For example, the thread could hold a lock, which would mean you will get a deadlock. So killing a thread is bad. So what we have in C++ is cooperative interruption. This means you can send to any running entity a signal and now this running entity can but must not react to it. This mechanism is split in it uh, improved the threat. She said, it and condition rebel any, you see. But you cannot, you can lose it for any running entity. You will see the few seconds. Cooperative interruption is based on two data types. First, we have a stop tool. And what you essentially do is, the running entity you want to send something to, gets a stop token. And the stop source can send a signal. So we have a stop token. You can ask if you if stop is possible, or you can ask if a stop was requested. By the way, you can only send once a signal. Only one time you can send a signal. This is the stop token. On the other side, we have a stop source. This is the way you get out of your stop tool. So out of the stop source, the stop tool. Then you can ask if the stop source can be requested to stop. You can ask if you already used it. Here you can request a stop. Let me show you a simple example. What's more, this is a little bit bad, now we have it. This is baked in 
in condition wrap any and G sweat. Okay, I have two G sweats. This have pretty long lambdas. This is a lambda here. If I counter zero, I wait until the counter is done. After each iteration, I sleep for a fifth of a second. And then I say, not interruptible. But this guy is special. It takes as first argument a stop to. And here I can use this top tool to ask if someone uh, wants to stop me, to question if someone wants to stop me. In this case, I just return, but you could do anything. And this guy is so simple, interruptible. Now see. My mate thread sleeps for one second. Send the request to stop comes. To both threads, you see. The interruptible, not interruptible. But only the interruptible stops. We have here a little bit of interleaving. But you see, only non interruptible continues. Because interrupted cannot react. Uh, not interrupted cannot, will not recognize this stop signal. This is the G thread. Originally, it should be called I thread for interruptible thread, but now it's called G thread for joinable thread. But anyway. Okay. But this make a discipline. Oh, I have to show you another example. I don't have it here. This mechanism is way more powerful than I thought in the first place. Have a look here. I have a stop source. Then I create a stop token out of it. And what I do now, stop tokens are extremely cheap to copy. I copy this stop token into this function one. And you see what function one is doing? It sleeps for a second and then ask if a stop was requested. And if so, I just output something. I do this for a thread. I can also do it for G-thread. I can do it first to the sync. This is a promise. I can do it for the explicit data type promise, and now I execute function two. Function two is special. Have a look. Function two, line 15, I registered a stop callback. This means this callback is invoked when I send a signal. You can register arbitrary number of callbacks, but you don't have to guarantee which order they are executed. So here I just register the callback, which says stop requested. Only for fun. 
I also uh, spending. I also ask the maid sweat if a stop was requested. And here I request a stop, which means I send a signal. And here's the output. Sorry, I forgot that I don't have this example here. So let me just uh, make this for you. Uh, what's the fastest way to do it? I want to show you a special use case. for condition variable ID. I just take a look in my book. I thought I had it inside this presentation, but I forgot it. Mm, yeah. With condition we have ended, but wait a second, can I make it a little bit bigger? I think this is better when I do it this way. Where's my view? Sorry, I'm not the fastest one anymore. 52 is. Drive it. Now you see the web functions wait, wait for, wait until can also accept a stop token. You mean when you have a condition variable, you can awake it with a notification, but also with a signal. Let me show you how this looks like. And what's more, this is unique about condition variable. Eddie. The point is, Condition variable weight returns value red. When this is true, you know it's uh, it's a walk because of a notification it returns false. It's a walk because of a stop request. So it means you can awake a condition variable any by a stop request. So. I make this short. Let me skip this here. Okay, this asks the question you had before. What is special here? Okay, I'm also going to start with my presentation. A few uh, remarks. With 20, we have a cheese sweat. In a cheese sweat, will automatically call join its destructor if the thread is still joinable. Therefore, you don't have to call join. The thread will do it. G thread is modeled after RAII. Its destructor you call, it's called, it will call join. But when you use a thread, you get this Aki uh, message. Terminate call without an active exception. You see, I forgot to call 
Troy to T. Gate surface to turbulent is called its uh, destructor. But this will not happen when you do it with G thread because G thread will automatically join. You see, now it's all black here. You may know that I used before this helper function to synchronize output. This is, of course, necessary in war. In C20. What you can do in C20, but I could not do it when I uh, created this presentation because it was not implemented. Can you synchronize output streams? And this means when you write something to synchronize output streams, it goes to the buffer, to the internal buffer, and when the internal buffer goes out of scope, it flushes its output. This is also an application of RAIA. Resource acquisition is initialization. Here's an example. You have standard C out wrapped into an output stream, synchronized output stream. Then I write something to it. This end, by the way, has no effect. Usually it would flush the output stream, but not here. The output stream is flushed when its scope ends, which means exactly, means exactly here. So the buffer is flushed. You can also do it on a temporary here. Give a look. This data type gets an R value and its lifetime ends here. And therefore, here you have an atomic write operation. So the idea of synchronized output strips is that a line will written in an atomic step. And here, my last remark is the example once more. This is, by the way, from C3 reference. I have stood out encapsulated. I write hello, Edward. And in between, I, I create a temporary rubber. Therefore, first, goodbye, plan is uh, displayed. And afterwards, hello world. By the way, this program is too complicated. You can also simplify it. This program gives the same output. Because what's more, here the R value goes out of scope. Because this entity has no name. Okay. You see, I'm done. This is what we talked about, you see. That, uh, that there are a few really nice things in 20 regarding concurrency. So, first of all, Klaus, any questions? All right. Then, first of all, a big thank you uh, for the talk. Again, let's give people a couple of seconds to, to write something. I do have a question and not a perfectly serious one. Um, is Andre a part-time worker because in the afternoon he is doing D? I don't know. <laughs> I only want to. Okay, so. Andreas could. 
Andrew Alexandrescu. Exactly. So, okay. So, um, give people a couple of seconds to type the questions. Um, and then um, there should be a few one. Um, so, while we're waiting, perhaps I do have a question, a, a more bigger picture question. So we, we always argue that C++ is too low level from a concurrency point of view. Yeah, threats, mutexes, etc. Do you now feel that we are that they have reached a better stage? That these the ledgers, the barriers, the semaphores have reached a higher level of concurrency, and that this makes uh, programming with concurrency simpler? Of course. For me, C++ eleven is the first abstraction layer. Mm -hmm. And 20 and the parallel STL future promises are built on top. Mm -hmm. But it's a way high abstraction. And I assume we will get very, very more abstraction when we finally got uh, baked proteins, transaction, transaction memory. And, mm -hmm. Maybe I send the receivers. This is what I hope for. But this is something which you can observe in any programming language. We fight for the abstractions. This is not only due to C++. I only want to give you a short idea. Mm -hmm. In Python, say, invented. Coroutines with a keyword yield around 25. Now say now that they will do it differently. You see, it takes a long, long time to see which abstraction we need. Because concurrency is the really, really hard stuff. Oh, most definitely. You think we're on the right way. So do you think that we're doing the right things also perhaps uh, uh, quick enough? Because of course, uh, waiting for a couple of years, perhaps decades, uh, might not be might not make people happy. So do you think we are on the on the right track? We have two strong issues, mm -hmm. serious issues. We are by design broken. We have by design all is not const. And by the side, we have no cure functions. And this makes it way, way, way more complicated. This is the reason, by the way, why programming languages, such functional programming languages, mm -hmm. such as Haskell, have a way easier job to, to, uh, to, to do. But this is our burden because we are 40 years old, 45 years old. Mm -hmm. Today, we, we would do it a total, total different. I, I'm pretty sure. All right. So, there are no further questions. Yeah, so let's wait for. Uh, oh, oh, there is it. Okay. Probably it just did not um, load quickly. So, here's the question What's the relationship between traditional concurrency and coroutines? Are these two orthogonal concepts? Is there an overlap? Uh, when do we consider one or the other? Okay. For me, they are orthogonal. They have nothing to do. But it's what you often do is that you uh, implement coroutines using threads and root. The main benefit from the point of coroutines are, I would say, that they are extremely lightweight. And they live in the user space. You don't have to go in the kernel and do the heavy stuff. Uh, Klaus, and uh, Klaus. Andreas. Andreas, if you have to add something <laughs> regarding coroutines. <laughs> yeah. Because Andreas has given a talk about coroutines. Um, I, I already think this answers the question. Thank you. Yeah, for um, me also. But I want to give Andreas the, ch the chance to say something. Okay, he says nothing to add from me. Try it, <laughs> Andreas. <laughs> Perfect. 
Um, okay, now, this is your chance to ask a couple of questions. So we'll just hang around for uh, perhaps one or two more minutes. Now is your chance. Uh, so please post something or perhaps even just post something quick so that we know that you're currently typing a question. All right. Um, last question from my side. What do you think is the most valuable addition uh, that you talked about today? So what, yeah, after uh, having used all of these, what do you think uh, you, you definitely don't want to miss anymore? This is hard. The last one is the most complicated one. <laughs> so you could also say everything is kind of important because they solve different problems, but I guess you have a favorite. For me, probably the extension of the atomics. Okay. Because I'm a big, big anti fed I hate conditioned rebels. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> yeah, okay. They are so error prone. So I... easy to use right, uh, wrong. And now you can easily synchronize on atomics. But of course, this is a low level feature. Mm -hmm. But also, semaphores are nice. So forget about it. I also like semaphores. <laughs> so, in the end, everything's great uh, whenever it, it becomes. Yeah, handy. this is. Yeah. I always assumed you would say J thread because this tiny addition of a proper destruction is, is already so so valuable. But I, I also totally get You are right, of, but what I recognized was you cannot just, when you have a stood thread, mm -hmm. switch to a G thread and then remove the join. Mm -hmm. The point is the semantic of your program changes. And this may sometimes end in a deadlock. So it's not so easy to just replace us with mm -hmm. I saw this a few times. Because the sweat mm -hmm. will live a little bit shorter or longer. And this may end the semantic of your program. Change the semantic of your program. That's a deep insight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was totally astonished when I experienced it. All right, perfect. So there's unfortunately no further question. So then a final big, big thank you for first taking time and also to um, work us through these uh, these new additions in C20. All right, so everybody, uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for um, joining us. We'll see each other again in July when we have a new, uh, our next MOOC plus plus meetup, uh, which will again be an on-site meetup. Okay, have a great rest of the evening. Bye. Goodbye.